All right, students. So the next um, the next example that we're going to go through is actually looking at the malware file, um, which I'm going to bring up here just because I've been uh, doing this um, uh, for some of the previous examples. So um, the malware file uh, that was generated in Lab 8. Uh, so that's the one that's called malware.pdf uh, that was distributed with um, an exe and also some forensics that were collected from the VM image when it was run inside of a sandbox. Um, <clears throat> uh, that's the content you're looking at the screen right here. And we're looking at the raw content, um, very similar to before. So if I go all the way down here, you know, the trailer tells me that the root object is three. Um, the root object is right here. The root object is uh, telling me that um, uses a certain set of, ex of uh, extensions. Um, and then uh, that there's a form, Acrobat form, at object 2, which is up here. Um, the type for object 3 is catalog. Um, and then the pages for the, uh, for the document are located at object 4 down here. And then there's a needs rendering equals true. <clears throat> so a bunch of additional features that I won't go into. Um, inside the pages, you can see the count is one, very similar to what we looked at before. Uh, the kids, so the child object of this is a uh, five. Um, and then this is telling us that the type is a pages object. And so then here's this, the type of this is a page, which is very consistent with what we saw before. The contents are at six O um, R, so that's right here. Um, and there's a stream. <clears throat> and so this one's really interesting. So the contents here, um, actually have these string contents right here. So pedefe, pedefeto, pedefeon, um, so which I, I believe is, uh, is possibly Italian, um, though I'm not entirely certain. Um, and then it defines the font. So the structure here um, of, of this is actually very similar um, to the structure right here, right? So you have the catalog object right here, and then the page, pages, you know, count one, kids, you know, the indexes are different. Um, this one didn't define a media box for whatever reason, maybe, uh, maybe there's a default media box or something like that that it, uh, that it'll use. Um, <clears throat> and then the contents, you know, so the type page is right here. You know, the contents are located. So the contents are referenced down here. And it even went in to go and define the font and everything like that using a lot of the same structure that was right here. So you can see this is a very common recipe uh, for a very simple PDF generation. Uh, one of the uh, key things here to keep in mind is just that um, the exploit that's being taken advantage of, or I should say the vulnerability is being taken advantage of by the exploit um, is actually in the XFA code. Um, so it's going to be JavaScript. Um, and so if you remember, this thing said there's an Acrobat form that's at 2.0. So 2.0 is right here. And then 2.0 says that there's a XFA content, which is a type of data that's specific to PDF. Um, and that's at 1.0 which I'll scroll back up, and it's up here. So 1.0 object, so object 1, um, has a length 87.92, so all this data down here. Um, and then the filter is a flate decode, so FL is just short for flate decode, so it allows you to use um, shorthand if you want. So that's also another great thing to keep in mind is that um, though the, you know, <clears throat> Though we looked at the um, you know, full name of the filter earlier, um, this particular malware author chose to uh, use a shorthand version of that, which might accidentally get overlooked or ignored by, uh, um, by some programs that are supposed to do analysis that aren't taking into consideration variables like that.
So, so we'll go ahead and uh, run the same stats on this. So Python 2, PDF parser dash A, uh, malware dot PDF. And you can see the structure here is a bit similar, or is a bit simpler than um, than the structure of the PDF that I exported from the web browser earlier. So um, it identifies that there's this um, XFA object that's up here. Um, the acro form was defined down in object three. So right here, right? So it referenced the acro form. <clears throat> and then um, one thing you'll notice, uh, I mentioned this in the write up, is that um, there's always this first entry here, and the first entry just starts with a number, but you can see the number slightly indented. That's because the first entry of this actually starts with um, starts with null. Um, so there's the concept of a null typed objects, so objects that don't actually specify a type in PDF. Um, and that's all these objects that don't contain a slash type keyword. So this one has a slash type pages. This one has a slash type page. This one has a slash type catalog. Um, but this one up here doesn't have a type at all because it doesn't need a type. Um, and this one down here also doesn't have a type because it doesn't need a type. And then finally, this one up here doesn't have a type because it doesn't need a type. Um, this one's automatically determined to be a stream type, you know, et cetera. So, you can see that here, the three that aren't typed are up here, and then it tells you the count of three of them. So I'm going to remove that stream three that was created earlier, just so that it doesn't confuse me. Um, and then I'm going to run PDF parser dash O. Um, so I already walked through the document, so I'm not going to do the you know, analytical steps starting from the root using PDF parser on the command line. I'm just going to go straight to object one. So object one is where the where the evil or the badness lives. Um, so I'm going to start with just trying to pull that uh, as keywords out. So you can see object one uh, contains stream. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to dump the stream data to stream one dot dat. And you can see stream one dot dat was created, and um, 87.93 is the um, size that it extracted. So that ends up being um, one longer than what was right here. So this is a really good um, uh, this is a really good demonstration, um, and it might help me. It might help uh, to just do this right. So um, So if I was to do dash H like that, um, you can see that it's actually um, the pulling out a much longer, um, well, this is the object, right? Um, but basically what's happening here is uh, it's automatically determining that um, there's more than 8792 bytes uh, inside of the stream. So it's just using the number of bytes that it found. And the reason for that is um, is pretty simple. Um, when we get down here to the stream, um, end stream doesn't happen right here at the end of this line. End stream, there's actually a new line and then end stream happens here. So Acrobat's considering that new line or the, uh, you know, the new line character that was added there, it's considering that part of the stream. Uh, for this exercise, it's harmless. Um, however, uh, when you're doing extracting streams manually, um, or I should say extracting streams and uh, programmatically like this using these tools, um, it's just something to keep in mind um, that uh, if I extract the stream because I want to then pass that stream to another tool uh, and that tool fails and says that the stream is unrecognized, it might, uh, it might be because some extra data was pulled off um, by a PDF parser. Um, that you might have to actually go in and edit the file by hand to clean it up. <clears throat> in this case, um, it's not a big problem, um, but I will say that um, if I look at it, 
you know, the size is the same, so it's clearly not decompressed. I can validate that by looking and seeing that the compressed data bytes here are the same ones that are right here. So just like earlier, I want to use the dash F option, as in Frank, <clears throat> to extract a decom uh, decompressed version of that code. And you can see that's right here. So um, I'll put this in a more human readable format. So uh, stream one was about 8.6K. Stream one decompressed is 87 megabytes. So almost 90 megabytes, right? Um, <clears throat> so that ends up being something like, a, I guess, a, a, you know, 10,000 times larger than, um, than it was when it was compressed. Um, that's a very large file. I'm not going to try and open it with Vim, but I will open it with a uh, hex dump. And you can see um, <clears throat> there's all the contents. There's a lot of human readable contents in there, which um, again, um, I had mentioned that this was going to be JavaScript and you can see down here uh, is a little bit of JavaScript. And then likewise, there's all of this data right here, or this um, base64 encoded data right here. So what I might want to do is I might want to create a file called interesting.txt. And I'll just put this in here, right? But then also what I might want to do is I might want to open up that stream three decomp dot dat. I might want to open that up as well. Uh, stream one decomp dot dat. So it'll take a moment to load it up, um, but there it goes. Uh, and so um, I can look through here and I can see that um, there's this XML definition for the forms. So it talks about form server and form one and all that stuff, um, which is all part of the built-in um, Adobe Acrobat forms uh, capability. So um, I'm not an expert on all of the features in the PDF language, but I believe this is uh, something to do with the feature that allows you to get a PDF, um, enter your information into the different uh, placeholder fields in the PDF, like you're filling out a form, but you can fill it out by typing, uh, and then you can print the entire thing out and it looks really nice instead of having to hand write all of the form fields. Um, so inside of here, there's uh, some JavaScript. Um, and then down here is actually some comments that were brought that were um, put in here as well from the JavaScript. And you can see that um, this person, Eddie Mitchell, ended up adding some additional information in here, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then there's these, you know, there's this large chunk of data here. Um, and then we can see that repeating sequence that we noticed earlier, right? So um, this goes on for quite a while. So you can see that I'm still only at 0% of the file. Um, so if I was to go to the end of the file, uh, down here are many, many lines down. Um, but I can go and explore um, the different um, aspects of code in here. So one of the things I like about this exploit, and one of the reasons I used it in class is um, when you deconstruct it, uh, the um, the JavaScript that's in here is actually very uh, readable. So for instance, you can see that it's trying to embed kernel 32 or virtual protect into, um, into the file somewhere. Um, you can see that it's building something that's called pointer slide. Uh, and if I go up here, right, um, there's a number of comments that talk about what's going on. So this right here 
talks about uh, the actual assembly language being used. So, you know, the exchange inst instruction followed by jump to the get module function and then get proc address is uh, going to be uh, placed somewhere on the heap as well. So, um, you know, it's talking about where all of those things are located in memory. Um, Likewise, you can say corrupted strings was found. Let's generate the new string for overlapping the struct before freeing it, etc. So there's a lot of real good data in here um, that explains what the author's doing. Uh, so it's a really good um, case study in the complexity involved in building an exploit. And then here's that long list of hexa, um, base64 content that I had uh, run into earlier. So, you know, I have that, um, <clears throat> I have that interesting string. Uh, so what I might do is I might go through here and I might try and, um, you know, pull in like virtual protect, right? So, um, virtual protect. So whenever you see word like this, um, there's a strong possibility that this is a, um, you know that this is a Windows function, uh, so it's worth looking up in Microsoft's online documentation to try and see what it does. Um, change the protection of committed pages in the virtual space of a calling process. So change the protections of memory. So this would be a very odd thing to see in a PDF because this is a very low level system operation and the PDF's not even supposed to care whether it's on Windows or not. Um, so, um, you know, it might be a good idea for me to try uh, saving that as well. Um, I might go ahead and grab, like, you know, this stuff, right? So I'll grab one of those, like that. And so that's my interesting stuff, right? So I'll, I'll save that. Uh, for now. We'll go through here and try and see, you know, what else is going on. Uh, or I should say, what other features we can go and explore here. So uh, one of the useful things would be like this search stream here, right? So let's go back to the PDF, or, or not the PDF, but the uh, content of the PDF for a moment. And uh, remember that it talks about this person, Eddie Mitchell, right here. So maybe what I can do is I can go and do search stream equals Eddie Mitchell. So search stream is right here. Search, string to search in, in the streams. So um, what this is going to do is actually going to look in all the streams to see if it can find um, that name. So I'm going to go and search um, for Eddie Mitchell, the string within the malware PDF. I can search for it this way, and then it's going to output the objects that it shows uh, that it shows up in. Um, <clears throat> Likewise, if I wanted to, I could search for. Um, I'm going to use S to search in the indirect objects, so not the streams, for something like, you know, we'll say font, right? And that'll show the objects where font shows up uh, in the object itself, right? So not in the stream, but in the object. <clears throat> so likewise, if I wanted to go and find that XFA stuff, I could do it like that, right? So, or if I wanted to search for length, I can see there's two objects where length uh, shows up in the object definition. So anyway, getting back to search stream, I could search like this. Um, if I was trying to search for this, nothing would show up. So validate that it's only showing me the first object because that actually does match. Um, Another thing I could do 
is I can do a regular expression search like this, regex, and maybe I want to do Mitchell or Sanders, right? But if I change this first one, then it won't match. So I can use regular expressions with the powerful regular expression language um, to try and search within the streams to tell me which objects have that match within the streams. So this is potentially really powerful. Um, but then the last uh, or the next thing that we'll do is um, uh, also demonstrated here, and that's to generate a YAR rule that I want to search. And this is likely um, when you're working uh, within a community of people that are doing uh, malware analysis. <clears throat> you're going to be all building up. Well, here I'm going to close this. You're going to be all building up a lot of um, uh, <clears throat> a lot of new um, malware rules, uh, and you'll probably be sharing them in a format like this. Uh, so this is the rule that I um, demoed in, during the lecture. Uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to take these strings out um, and I'm going to try and put uh, the content that we found is interesting in here as well uh, in instead. So I'm going to put it here and then I'm going to put like a B64 data right here. I'm going to put vprotect here, and then I'm going to put 4f here. So now I've got these three strings. Um, one of the other things that I'm going to add here is because this is a string and it has to match the C string format, which is pretty common across every single programming language. Uh, I have to make sure that these backslashes are escaped um, so that when it's trying to do the match, it's not matching on U, it's matching on slash followed by U, followed by 4F, 4F. <clears throat> right. So now I've got a nice YAR rule put together, and um, what I can do. I'm going to do help. So it's always helpful to kind of have this up um, while I'm doing uh, what I'm doing. So I'm going to use this option down here to give it the rule that I just made. And I'm actually going to change the name of this just so it's not find rock comments, but it's find um, interesting values, right? So that's what I'm going to call it, find interesting values. So I'm going to do yara find it dot yar and then malware dot pdf. Yep. So I have a small syntax error, uh, which is something that I can fix. Um, so there, I just didn't put quotes around it. So important to remember to have quotes around it. So then I got a um, I got a YAR error, so we'll see um, what is giving me the YAR error. Okay, so um, what I learned was that uh, for whatever reason, this value right here, possibly because it happens frequently within the file, is causing an error. So I just removed it from the R rule that I hand wrote. Um, and so now uh, we'll go and run this one. And so that's a very you know, useful thing to keep in mind is just uh, if you have a, a um, uh, if you have a, a value like that that happens frequently uh, within the file um, <clears throat> or too frequently, um, you might end up causing the R engine when it's running inside of 
um, the PDF parser um, to fail, um, likely due to the limited memory constraints that are available when it's running inside of Python like that. So just keep that in mind. And then when I run it uh, with those things, I'm able to identify, you know, the object that uh, that contains that data. So right here I have that. You can see it. So I've been able to use Yara. Um, it tells me what the file was. Um, and then it also says find interesting values. So another thing if I wanted to is I can make a rules folder and then I could move my Yara rules into the rules folder, right? And so <clears throat> so I actually grabbed the find ROP uh, that was on the uh, course site and put it in here as well. So if I want to, I can go and do rules. And then what it does is it tells me, whoops, it tells me that it found, or it found a match using both of those signatures, and it also tells me exactly which file caused the match as well. So it's really helpful for me to then go and just use the output of this. If I gave the output of this to someone else, they'd be able to very easily track it down to which file and which signature uh, was doing the matching. So finally, um, one of the other things that can be very helpful can be the uh, generate code. So da the dash G option. So this right here um, won't dive into it too much other than just showing you that it exists. Um, I'm going to run malware. I'm going to run it with a, so you can, similar to before, you can run it with a dash F or you can just do it raw. So I'm actually going to run it with a dash F. Um, malware.pdf. And then I'm going to say malware pdf.py. So what this is going to do is it's going to create a PDF file or a Python file that can, that when run, uh, can actually output my PDF file. So we'll give it a moment to load. Uh, again, there's a lot of there's a lot of content in it, so it's going to take a while to actually load up. And there you go. So you can see, uh, and it took a moment. Um, Python took a moment to actually load the file up because uh, it has to go and try and figure out what the syntax highlighting is going to look like. But you can already see that it's outputting the different um, PDF uh, objects. So I'm actually going to, let's look at hello.pdf, hello pdf.py, then hello pdf.py. So you can see all the content is very similar to the previous one. Um, and then there's the content that we saw unfiltered. Um, you can see that it's creating the different indirect objects as well. And then down here, it adds the XREF and trailer and all that stuff. So the trailer pointing to object 28, which is right here, which is the catalog, which then says to go all the way up to the top of the file for the pages object. So, you know, in general, that's kind of how, um, you know, the document objects constructed. So um, you can go in there and you can mess with that if you want to edit the, you know, the generation of it. So for instance, if I wanted to change uh, any of this content in here, um, or likewise, um, in the exploit document that we were looking at, um, if I wanted to change any of the uh, Pyth uh, the JavaScript code that was in there, um, I could do that, and then I could run the program, uh, and it would uh, output that to disk. Um, so I'll go down here, and just remember that you have to get this make PDF, so I have a link down here, and I also have a link at the top. So if I go and grab this, I can fetch it.
and I can see that there's this mpdf.py. So unzip, make, make PDF. So then what I can do is I can run the hello pdf.py and I can call it new hello.pdf. So there we go. So new hello PDF is a little bit, is slightly bigger than hello.pdf, but it's roughly the same size. And if I wanted to, I could do new hello.pdf with the events. And there we go. It looks almost identical to um, the PDF that we were looking at earlier. Likewise, if I wanted to do um, malware pdf.py, I could do new malware.pdf. And then it'll go and try and run. Um, and it might take a little while. That actually completed rather quickly. And then there's my new malware.pdf. So one of the neat things here is that new malware.pdf ended up being 404 kilobytes, while malware.pdf, if I can find it, is actually 9K. So it didn't actually compress as well um, when it made it here. And I might be able to look at that and try to figure out why. And I don't know why, but... Um, it must just have something to do with how it was um, encoded. So maybe the compression algorithm that I have um, built into my version of Python um, or the deflate algorithm that is written into that MPDF library isn't the same as the one that the author used.